Introduction We will utilize a philosophical perspective in our discussion of the science-religion relationship in Islam. We will limit our investigation to the Qur'an, the holy book and foundational text of Islam. Although the Qur'an is the primary religious reference for Muslims, historical events, interpretations of different sects, and the hadiths, later accounts of things said or done by Muhammad, political movements, and Sufi schools of thought, etc., have influenced Muslim understandings of science. Thus, a study that focuses only on the Qur'an precludes a host of Islamic views on its relation with science. However, given the authority of the Qur'an, that it should function first and foremost in Islamic understandings of the issues related to science is evident. The phrase science-Qur'an relationship is often associated with the evaluation of the Qur'an's content or validations of its authority through scientific theories. This is called ijaz. For example, some hold that the Big Bang theory or the theory of evolution can be evaluated with respect to Quranic texts. Others argue that the Quran affirms the expansion of the universe and the descriptions of the stages of the embryo in the mother's womb in ways remarkably consonant with recent scientific discoveries. The expression also harkens back to the era when Muslims established the most sophisticated civilization of science and philosophy during the 9th through 13th centuries. While all of these aspects of Islam-science relationship are important, none will be our main focus. Instead, we will focus on the Qur'an and its claims for scientific activities. According to the Islamic faith, the Qur'an was revealed by God to the Prophet Muhammad for the salvation of humankind. The Qur'an's message contains a God-centered ontology, explanations of what will happen in the afterlife, statements that this message is the final ring in a historical chain of prophetic messages, anecdotes about how societies lived in the past, moral commands, rituals to be performed, and actions that should be avoided. The Qur'an is primarily concerned with what should be believed in and, second, with what should and should not be done in life. Likewise, the scientific endeavor includes both rightly held beliefs and rightly ordered practices. In our discussion of the relationship between the Qur'an and science, we will focus on these two aspects, belief and practice. The first part of the book is devoted to the former and the second to the latter. In the first part, we will investigate the relationship between the scientific endeavor and our thesis. The mental structure developed in the Quran supports the presuppositions of science. We are not aware of any other work on this topic. We believe that the content of our book is novel, particularly in this regard, and that part of the book deserves special attention. The accord between the ontological conceptions presented by the Qur'an and the presuppositions needed for scientific activities does not necessitate all believers of the Qur'an to adopt these presuppositions. A believer of the Qur'an might be unable to establish the relation between these presuppositions and content of the Qur'an or unable to realize that science requires these presuppositions. Likewise, he or she might also be totally uninterested in science. Here we claim that the logical ground for accepting the correctness of the Qur'an complies with the adoption of mental presuppositions behind scientific activities. To what degree this mentality is adopted by Muslims is not our concern. The term presupposition, it should be noted, is sometimes associated with prejudice. Science, on the other hand, seeks objectivity and universality. However, we use presupposition only to mean the beliefs assumed in scientific activities. Our usage will become clear as we proceed. Presuppositions can also evolve. They are not dogmatic beliefs, even though some people treat them as so. Nonetheless, they form previously accepted knowledge, and since we are unable to constantly revise our existing knowledge, they stay behind our mindset whether we realize it or not. Correct presuppositions support correct evaluations, and wrong ones can trigger a chain of falsehoods. 
No system of thought can exist without presuppositions since it is impossible to resort to first principles infinitely many times. All disciplines are founded on certain fundamental presuppositions. Logic, arithmetic, and geometry, considered the most reliable disciplines, are built upon presuppositions called axioms. All proofs within these disciplines are made via those axioms. The analysis we will perform here is about an ideal mind isolated from society and psychological factors. How this mind can acquire presuppositions within the paradigm the Qur'an offers and how it is motivated by the Qur'an. In other words, we aim to present the presuppositions of an ideally rational mind when it is properly shaped by the Qur'an with all non-rational influences excluded. Through this methodology, we intend to comprehend the relation of the content of the Qur'an with scientific activities. The mind of an individual who accepts the message of the Qur'an is shaped by a theistic ontology. We use theism synonymously with monotheism. According to this ontology, God is one, rational, mighty, and merciful. One's belief in the message of the Qur'an may or may not be a result of search and scrutiny. Although faith based on search and scrutiny is more valuable, religious believers often cling to their faiths without going through such processes. He is the creator and sustainer of all beings. Judaism and Christianity likewise adopt a theistic ontology, and in this respect they are on par with the Qur'an. We will describe the differences between a theistic ontology and naturalism, that is, atheism or materialism. Atheism is the philosophical thought rejecting the existence of God. Naturalism is the philosophical thought rejecting the existence of anything other than nature, namely matter, energy, and space-time. As a consequence, naturalists reject God, as He is not a physical being. All naturalists are atheists, but not all atheists are necessarily naturalists since they might believe in other non-natural beings such as mind or soul and moral or aesthetic truths. In reality, however, most atheists are also naturalists. Materialism is the philosophical thought that matter is the fundamental building block of everything in the universe, including mental processes and consciousness. In this regard, materialism is closely related to naturalism, and yet, even though nearly all materialists are also atheists, materialism does not necessitate atheism. One can believe in God and still hold the view that all the processes in the universe are materialistic. Since God is not a material being, this later thought is rarely adopted and nearly all materialists define themselves as atheists. Despite these nuances, the term atheism naturalism, and materialism are often used interchangeably. Likewise, these adjectives can be attributed to almost all well-known atheists in history. Thus, throughout this book, whenever we use the term naturalism, you can consider it synonymous to atheism and materialism. As we will show here, a theistic ontology but not a naturalistic ontology, supports many presuppositions required for practicing science. It should also be noticed that the Qur'an has certain aspects that are not present in other theistic beliefs along with other aspects that are comparatively more emphasized. We will concentrate on seven presuppositions to show that the mental structure shaped by the Qur'an supports the presuppositions of science. The first presupposition we will consider is that the universe has a rational and comprehensible structure. If scientists had not assumed that the universe had a rational, that is, suitable for the mind to comprehend structure, it would have been meaningless for them to study it. The second one is that the human mind is capable of acquiring true knowledge about the universe. Scientific work would be meaningless if the mind were unable to reach the truth. According to the third presupposition, the universe, that is, the object of scientific activity, is discoverable. Science loses its meaning 
if discovery is considered impossible. According to the fourth, the laws discovered by scientific activities are universal. If the laws are different at different places and times, then it would be worthless to work toward their discovery. Fifth is that the study of the universe, the matter and the living, that is, all subjects of science, is a valuable pursuit. If an activity is not worth the effort, it would hardly ever start. Sixth, observation is essential in the acquisition of knowledge about the universe. Science cannot be practiced solely through armchair thinking because observation is the ground of scientific thinking. This presupposition is closely related to the Quran's invitation to observation, and it's important to remark that not every theistic belief has this aspect. Finally, mathematics is essential for the comprehension of the universe. The failure to use mathematics prevents one from penetrating sufficiently into the universe and makes precise predictions of past and future impossible. While many naturalists practice science with these presuppositions in mind, the theist has rational grounds for adapting them. The aim of this book is to present the Quranic foundation of this rationality. Although our purpose is to evaluate the relationship between the Quran and science, since the Quran preaches a theistic ontology, many of the arguments we offer are relevant to the theism-science relationship in general. In the second part of the book, we will show that the Quran also provides motivation for scientific pursuits. No other major religious scripture encourages its believers to observe, contemplate, and reflect upon nature and natural phenomena to the extent of the Quran. In other words, the Quran is quite different from the other religions' texts regarding science. There is good theological motivation for pursuing the sciences. In Islam, knowing God is humanity's most valuable goal, and scientific activity can serve this goal. Activities dedicated to comprehending the universe also help us to understand the power and beauty of God. In other words, knowing the universe is a path towards knowing God. One of the best astronomers and mathematicians of his time, al Batani, 858-929, stated his motivation as, by focusing attention, observation, and extensive thought on astronomical phenomena, one is able to prove the unity of God and to recognize the extent of the Creator's might as well as His wide wisdom and delicate design. The Quran is not the only source of motivation for scientific pursuits. Reputation, money, charisma, social status, etc., can also motivate people to do science. The psychological appeal of these other motivation sources is apparent. However, since knowing God and fulfilling God's commands far surpass any other motivating factor, they constitute a superior source of motivation for a Muslim.